in this final lesson in which we are providing a basic overview and, and some foundational knowledge as to the historical development of the US Constitution, I want to just get to the point in which we actually see the ratification and the creation of the Constitution, as well as some of the ideological debates and ideological issues that were taking place uh, and during and immediately after the creation of the, the, the US Constitution. So this is part of the specification. As noted, this isn't specifically cited in the specification. Like I've said in the first of these lessons, I thought it'd be very important that we just spend some time taking a basic overview of the, of the sort of foundational knowledge of this particular topic. The reason for this, of course, is because is because if you want to know about the US Constitution and all the ways that it works, it's important that we get an idea of, of why it works in the ways that it does. And for those of you who are studying A-level politics for AQA, you're more than likely going to have been somebody who um, was born in, in the UK or, or is at least studying in the UK and so have little to, uh, knowledge about the history of America or little knowledge about the history of this part and this time period of, of, of the American Revolution. So this, this essential lesson is going to discuss the intellectual debates which surrounded the eventual creation of the US Constitution. This was created, of course, at the Constitutional Convention of 1787. And so I just want to just very briefly overview what we looked at at the end of the previous lesson. A basic recap of the, of the 1787 Convention is that it was clear that a new convention had to be, uh, a new constitution, should I say, had to have been created, okay? Uh, the delegates gra quickly drafted a new constitution, uh, uh, very, very, uh, very quickly decided that the Articles Confederation were not going to work. There were numerous challenges, including representation in Congress, balance of power between the federal government and the states, as well as the institution of slavery. We also then finished by talking about the Connecticut Compromise, the compromise essentially where you have smaller states and larger states. And there is the debate about how uh, how there is going to be uh, adequate representation. The smaller states, of course, favoured equal representation where they had just as much authority and representation as the larger states so that they don't get um, over uh, over uh, ran by the by the larger states. And then you have, obviously, on the other hand, the larger states who want to have their representation on the basis of uh, on the basis of, of the size of the population so that they would have a greater impact and influence over policy. And so with all of this being said, we get the Connecticut Compromise, where you end up with a bicameral legislature, where you have a Congress that is made up of a House of Representatives. The House of Representatives is based on population size and so therefore favours larger states. And then the Senate, on the other hand, has equal representation. So each state gets two Senate seats and therefore that favours the smaller states. That's how it works. Another compromise that existed surrounded the institution of slavery. So slavery still existed during the American Revolution and for a significant part of uh, the uh, early, early history of, of the United States. In fact, it only was abolished slavery after there was a civil war, which we're not going to get into in these lessons in any great detail. One of the compromises that uh, was represented in the creation of the US was something known as the Three-Fifths Compromise. This was the state compromise that was established in order to address how the issue of how slaves would be counted for the purposes of representation and for taxation. Were they counted as citizens? And so therefore the South would have a significant advantage over the North because then there are there are many, many thousands of or millions of slaves in the South. Um, the, the South is where the majority of slavery continued to exist. It started to get sort of weeded out as time went on in the northern and all northern states. And then they retained slavery all the way up to the Civil War. Well, the convention agreed that a three fifths compromise would be um, established. Essentially, what this means is that three fifths of the slave population would 
be countered. Um, uh, by by contrast, it represented essentially what an individual slave, um, uh, and it, the, the 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 weight of population that an individual slave would have would be that of a three fifths of a person, essentially, which is, uh, of course barbaric if we're looking at this from today's standard but that is how they represented it uh, in the 17 the late 1700s as part of um, the american revolution arguably more important for our purposes and for our studies in relation to the concept of the constitution is the debates between the federalists and the anti-federalists so once the constitution was drafted, it had to be ratified by at least nine of the 13 original states for it to have become effective. This led to a quite significant amount of debate among who were known as the Federalists, so the founding fathers who supported this new constitution, and the Anti-Federalists, the individuals who still opposed it. The Anti-Federalists opposed the new constitution because they feared it would give too much power to the national government and that this would essentially limit and curtail and strip away the rights of states as well as the individual liberties of people living within the states. In relation to supporting the ratification of the new constitution, Alexander Hamilton, James Madison and John Jay, uh, the th uh, three major uh, uh, federalists, uh, wrote a series of essays that became known as the Federalist Papers. And there was quite a significant number of uh, essays um, in the Federalist Papers. Uh, they all argued basically from various different angles and from very different perspectives um, in favour of the establishment of the Constitution and explaining its provisions. Now, to address one of the things that was issued to address the concerns of the Anti-Federalists, the people who were opposed to the US Constitution, was that the Federalists promised to add a Bill of Rights to the US Constitution, essentially protecting the ensuring, ensuring the protection of individual liberties. Um, this Bill of Rights was then ratified in 1791, and the Bill of Rights represents the first 10 amendments to the US Constitution. We will get into the Bill of Rights in far more detail as time goes on, um, but fundamentally you have obviously uh, freedom of speech uh, uh, and, and right to religion and assembly and these different kinds of things. These are all uh, elucidated in the First Amendment. Arguably the most controversial from the perspective of a, of a UK student and from the perspective of uh, today's modern conceptualization is, of course, the Second Amendment, which refers to the right to bear arms and the right for states to, to maintain a militia. And then you also have a, very, a variety of other amendments. The Fifth Amendment is very important often. Uh, the Sixth Amendment is, 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 is also interesting. We'll get into these in more detail in future lessons time because that will be part of our studies on civil liberties and, and, and individual rights uh, within the United States. So with all this being said, the Constitution was ratified by the required nine states on June sorry by June of 1788 and so it officially went into effect on the 4th of March 1789 the new congress the first congress that the new constitution convened uh, was uh, was convened uh, around this time as well George Washington was inaugurated as the first president of the United States as well as this the new government quickly set about organizing itself. It created a variety of new executive departments, such as a treasury and state departments. It also established a federal judiciary through the establishment of the Judiciary Act of 1789. And then it also would eventually go on to adopt the Bill of Rights, uh, point, start appointing members and justices to the Supreme Court, as well as the variety of circuit courts that began, a federal court system that began to establish itself. And then essentially the process of the Constitution begins to take place from there. We'll get into some of these things in more detail in future lessons time.